All right, so this is lecture 23 of ECE 503. So in today's lecture, we're going to actually continue from lecture 22 and discover what this parks mclellan algorithm is all about. Okay, so last lecture, what we looked at was this, this type of optimization, this, 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 this uh, optimization function here where we have the absolute value of this approximation error expression and some, from last class, from last lecture, what we, thought, what we saw this equal to is essentially some sort of frequency weighing function, the desired amplitude response minus from the actual that we designed using um, a collection of filter coefficients A of K. So uh, maybe, let me, let me um, I don't think the last lecture I did a great job um, describing that, so let, let me explain what this looks like. So what happens is, suppose I have A e to the j omega, and suppose that the amplitude response that we actually get, so obtained from, you know, these A k coefficients, right? And let's say it looks like this. Let's say we get an amplitude response that looks like that across frequency. Now, we have a d e to the j omega. And suppose it kind of looks like it, but it's a little off. Maybe it does that, does that, maybe a little bit, and such, right? And so... If we subtract the two off together, so this is desired, this is what we want. Desired, aka, what we want. All right? And so if now we subtract the two, so this would be the difference AD e to the j omega minus A e to the j omega, what we would get is something that looks like this. Let's say something that looks like that, right? So what we're looking for is at the same time in this frequency response, we might have something where certain frequencies we're very interested in minimizing and other frequencies that we do not care about minimizing whatsoever. So that's our weighing function. So let me update that. Frequency weighing function. And suppose it looks something like this. Suppose this region I don't care about, but this middle region I care a lot about and then don't care about the rest. Let's say something arbitrary like that. So what does E to the E j omega mean? It means the following. We have the weighing function. We take the magnitude of the difference of desired versus the actual amplitude response. Oops, sorry, that's supposed to be that. And what we're looking for essentially is we want to, from that, do minimize using the AKs the maximum of the error across all frequency. Uh, actually, no, we don't, we don't have the absolute value here. Sorry. We have it there. So what we're looking for is where is the largest error? Here, right? So the, this would give us the largest difference. So that's the largest error or difference. And it also falls within our weighing function, right? Everything else is discounted. It falls within the region of interest. And what we want to do is we now redesign our coefficients such that we reduce that error. We try and bring that guy lower. So it's no longer the largest error. But of course, 
course, whatever you modify in one place, you might get something modified somewhere else. Right? The problem is, is that whenever you touch one thing of your frequency response and you tweak those coefficients, hmm, you tweak those coefficients. Yeah, I didn't know the light was hanging from the ceiling like that. Hmm. So that's why no one's sitting there. So what ends up happening is you perturb something else, right? So if I poke, modify, change one part of the frequency response, something else changes too. And it might be for the worst, right? So that's why, like, you know, this design process is going to be iterative. What we're going to be doing is we're going to say, oh, what are the new coefficients? Try these out. Oh, but that made a large error over here. Okay, I have to change this. It's almost like, to me, I don't want to say it's like hopeless, but it's almost like, you know, the story of that boy in Holland, and he was biking along one of the dikes, you know, the big um, um, uh, earth, sometimes it's concrete, levees that keeps the uh, North Sea from flooding the countryside. And he sees a leak, and he po puts his finger in, and law cartoons make fun of this. And then another leak po pokes out, and he puts his finger in the other one. And then another leak and stuff. It's, like, I wouldn't say it's as hopeless or futile as that, but what happens is whenever you touch one part of the frequency response, something else might go in a direction that you might not want it to go. So it, in some ways, there's a little bit of trade-off as well, right? So that's what's happening here. So if, let's say, I redo the AKs, I might have something like this, which then, if I subtract it off from the desired, this might be lower, but now this might go larger, right? And that could be a problem. So then I redo, and I apply it again, and maybe it'll change those guys, and now another significant error in the desired versus the actual frequency responses will appear. So that's why this is kind of a fun algorithm, right? So you do it multiple times, you iterate, 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 ta-da, here are your coefficients, right? I'm going to keep that because that looks cool. Now, so that's this process here. And so there's something called the alt alternation theorem that allows us to process and achieve those coefficients. Okay, so the way the alter alternation theorem works is you have some union of closed subsets over an interval 0 to pi, right? That's f. And you have this weighing function. It's a positive weighing function. And so what we want to do, remember that expression again? How we got the amplitude response, the aej to the omega? It's a summation of these coefficients multiplied by the cosine, and the cosines themselves Ha, are, uh, can be represented as um, uh, Chebyshev polynomials, right? This guy here. So cos k omega, we can express it as Chebyshev polynomials of order k. And so what we want, we want this guy to be a unique function that minimizes the maximum value of the weighted error over the set f and that such that the error possesses at least two, no, L plus two alternations. W what? What does that mean? What does L plus two alternations mean? What it means is that there must be at least L plus two extremal frequencies. Right? So what that means is, suppose you have omega one, no, omega zero, which is larger than omega one, which is larger than these consecutive ever increasing frequencies. So omega zero, omega one, two, three, four, five, all the way to L plus one frequencies. So you have a total of L plus two frequencies in this range, right? And they're, cons and they're constantly increasing, one, two, three, four, five, all the way. And what happens is this is over that zero to pi region. 
what this says is that over this region, what ends up happening is that your error here, okay, so e to the e j omega k, it's going to be equal to minus of that error at e j omega k plus 1. So what does that say? What does that mean? It means that the error uh, at frequency omega k is going to be equal to the negative, the inverse, the negative. So, so it's, what it means is you have an error that peaks at omega k, and it's going to be equal to the error that bottoms out at omega k plus 1. So the next, so what you're, what you're getting is this kind of zigzaggy pattern. So for the L plus 2 frequencies across this range, what you're getting is these alternating errors. So it's a positive error, it's a negative error. It's a positive error, it's a negative error. It's a positive error, it's a negative error. Right? And that what also happens is that when you do the maximum across that range, right? What you're going to find is that it will be equal to it will be equal to that omega k. And what this is doing here, you know, this is how you find that optimum filter to be equiripple, right? So what we want to do is we want to have these extremal frequencies. What we want to have is essentially this like what we want to be is we want to have this mismatch between the desired which is equiripple, and the actual, we want to be in the right direction. We want to see that we have error that alternates just like the equiripple desired response that we're targeting for. All right? So that's what this alternation, alt, alternation theorem is all about. Let me draw that. So what does this guy mean? Oh, I have to get rid of my drawing. Oh, pity. I like my drawings. Thank God there's videos of them. <laughs> so what ends up happening is you have frequency omega naught, and it is less. It it, it will be less than o, omega one, omega two, do, 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 do. omega k, omega k plus one, do, 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 do. omega l plus one. So you have L plus 2 frequency locations. Okay? And so what this guy is saying is you have an error, right? So the alternate, alternation, alternation theory says okay, that your error... And I'm not using absolute value. I'm just using actual error, Abs not the absolute value of the error. At e to the j omega k is going to be equal to the negative of e e to the j omega k plus 1. And so what does that physically mean? So what this means is suppose I have... Suppose I have, like, you know, across omega, this is my desired, okay? Oh, no, no, no. So let me, no, I'm doing this wrong. No, no, no. Well, not wrong, but I'm... It's one diagram. Just want to... Where's the delete? Oh, there we go. Doop. Bye. Okay. So let's actually draw the, the equiripple frequency design. So what we've got in this case suppose this is desired, so I'm going to draw it in red.
Okay? And then this is what we actually get. So what, what we get is that if, if we, sub, what we get is what happens when we subtract, suppose this is one of the frequencies, omega naught. What do we have? We have a negative value. What happens if we, this is the next guy, omega one, what do we have? We have a positive value. How about this guy? Negative value. positive value. So what ends up happening is that alter, alternation theorem, what it's doing is this guy here, so at every, at every successive frequency, the error should be opposite in, uh, it, it, it op, uh, opposite in value in terms of like it's either negative or positive, but, in, but equal in magnitude or close to it. Okay. So what happens is that every one of these frequency points that I'm selecting, I'm getting that, right? Because I'm subtracting, subtracting red from blue and at those discrete frequency instances. In this case, at L minus 2, uh, sorry, plus 2 frequency instances. Okay? Now... Given that, what happens is we may have like optimal filters that possess more than L plus two exter extremal frequencies. And as a result, uh, what, what this gives us, like from this alternation theorem, what, what this tells us is that we can make these errors, we can make them, we can approximate them by epsilon. So what we're doing is, we can say, well, you know, the errors are approximately at, like, you know, in this case, if we use the alternation theorem, we can say the errors are the same in magnitude, but they're changing in sign. You know, at this frequency point, it's negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. And what happens is if we do this min-max business and we take the absolute value of that error, what does it give us? gives us epsilon. And it gives us, theoretically, at like multiple frequency instances, but it does not matter. So what we need to do is, remember that expression for a e to the j omega? To get that, to get the desired, we have this guy here, right? What we're going to try and do is we're going to try and solve for these coefficients and we have the error, and what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and solve for this large matrix expression. So we have here, what do we have? These are a desired, you know, amplitude response. This cosine here, one cosine omega naught, and then it's going to be two omega naught, three omega naught, four omega naught. What does that guy give us? That will give us, when we multiply it with a, uh, uh, a0, a1, a2, a3, what that guy will give us is it's going to get, and then on top of that, we have this 1 divided by omega e to the j omega naught. So this is omega naught frequency instance. So let's say we want to find the minimum, um, sorry, we want to minimize... We want to minimize the error at omega naught because it's epsilon. And we want to minimize the error at omega 1 because it's epsilon. We want to minimize the error at omega k because it's epsilon. Each one of these points has the same amount of error. So the first row of this matrix is, A1, uh, is, is essentially, this gives us AE to the j omega not. 
this second row gives us a e to the j omega 1. This row here, a e to the j omega 2, 3, 4, l, l plus 1. This last thing here, what is this guy? This guy, what happens is, so we have this sum, and then we have this term here, this weighing function, but one over that, and it's multiplied by epsilon. So how do we get that? Okay? I think that's it. Yep. Uh, no. Zero, one. And then this guy's one cos omega naught, cos two omega naught, da 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 da, and then one over the frequency weighing function for omega naught, and then this guy, okay, and so on and so forth. And so what happens when we take this row, multiply by this column, in order to give us this value, what is that equal to? Well, when I multiply just this part, with everything but the epsilon, that gives us a k, right? E, sorry, a k times cos omega naught, right? And so what is um, actually no 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 uh, k yeah k omega naught, and that we know is equal to e uh, sorry a e j omega naught. And then we have plus, this guy will multiply with that guy, e, uh, sorry, epsilon over w to uh, e j omega naught is equal to a e, a, a d e omega naught, right? So now what we've got is, if we bring this guy to the other side, we have epsilon w e to the j omega naught, a d e to the j omega naught, minus a e j omega naught. We multiply both sides by w, and hey, look, we got the error function, right? For omega naught. And simply what that matrix does What that matrix is doing is it's evaluating all L plus 2 errors of all L plus 2 frequencies. All right? So what I just done is just one row, the same column, one element of the column at the right-hand side, and I can do all L plus 2 of these rows with the one column. And so what I'm doing is now, this is actually pretty cool. What I've just done is I formulated, I'm going to keep that because that looks cool. Of course, I'm going to delete it later. But what I've just done, folks, is I've set up a matrix equation that consists of L plus 2 rows. I have L plus 1 unknowns plus an error and a desired frequency response. What I've just done is I've set up something where I'm going to find out. I'm going to solve for A0, A1, all the way to AL, right? So I'm going, to use, I'm going to use an optimization routine based on this matrix expression because I have these L plus 2 expressions. I'm going to solve every one of those A's. A, okay? So to achieve that, this is where Parks-McLellan comes in. 
So what Parks McLean does is we uh, what what it does is you know you have the extremal frequencies, and we need a way uh, first of all to identify where those guys are. So what Parks McLean does is first of all it finds an initial set of initial like you know of extremal frequencies. It solves for the epsilon based on the previous matrix expression that we have here using this equation and this one as well and then it evaluates the weighted error function over these over the set F and then it interpolates the extremal frequencies by Lagrange interpolation formula so what happens is we pick a set of extremal frequencies wherever they are we then evaluate them and then we interpolate extensively across the entire frequency range and we say, okay, of these errors, where do we get the extremal from this, right? So we pick a bunch of frequencies, we find the errors, we interpolate the errors across this frequency range, and we say, aha, ripple, 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 ripple. And we say, okay, now we've got these points. Let's say we get rid of our initial set of extremal frequencies and choose these instead and redo it. We might get closer but we might not be spot on because things change a little bit. So we resolve and resolve and resolve over and over again. So that's what this guy is. We choose a new set of extremal frequencies based on the last set. And we continuously do that until we rest on something that's within whatever tolerance we want in terms of that equi-ripple error type thing, right? As for the filter order, because that's the thing, like you notice with the window I just said, 100, 65. What happens is choosing the right filter order is actually really important when designing a filter. So what we do to find the appro appro approximate filter order for an equi-ripple linear phase FIR filter, we can use this expression here. So what we would do is we would do minus 10 log of uh, delta P, the stop band ripple, times delta S, the pass band ripple, minus 13 divided by 14.6 delta F, which is our transition band. So this really odd, I don't know where this equation comes from, gives us that approximate filter order to get what we want, right? So this is powerful stuff. So just make a mental note, like when you go to bed, just say, oh yeah, there is minus 10 log delta S times delta P minus 13 divided by 14 point, what? 6 delta F. It rolls off the tongue. So, okay. So let's, let's do a quick MATLAB example, okay? So there are, there's actually, so this, this type of, uh, there are a few built-in commands. I'm not sure if they're deprecated. The, these, uh, the, like, you know, so... What you can do is if you do help FIR, it's not there. <gasps> okay. Help FIRLS. So FIRLS, like what we talked about before, that's your li linear, oh, linear phase FIR filter using least squares error minimization. So that's, that's another type of filter we did not talk about. But if you do help FIR. PM, that's Parks McClellan, you get this guy instead. And all the gory details behind it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to make our own Parks McClellan filter. Okay? So all this messiness with iterative approximation, blah, 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 we don't have to worry about. Parks McClellan algorithm will handle that for us. So we're not, and usually these types of functions in MATLAB are already compiled. So they're not scripted, they're going to be really fast, all right? So, so suppose I want a, um, a, a, a passband bandwidth of 0.3 pi, so that's normalized to uh, a pi range, so from 0 to pi. We want a stop band region of 0.35 pi. We want a passband ripple of 0 0.01 and a stop band ripple of 0 0.0001. So what should be our filter order if we use that magical equation? It should be 102. Okay? So how do we build something like this? 
So if I wanted to design something like this, and I wrote it here, but let's say I let's let's um, what you would do is the following. So let's say we have B. So B. So this is an FIR filter. So do we have it? Do, if it's a rational response, do we have a denominator other than one? No. We only have numerator that's of a polynomial. Uh, of this case, it's going to be of an order of 102. So B is going to be equal to FIR PM order 102. And what this next bracket tells me is this defines pass band and stop band region in that order. So the first two values, 0 to 0.3, out of a normalized frequency range of pi, that tells me stop the pass band. And then from 0.35 to 1 tells me stop band. So 0, 0 0.3, sorry, and that it's already normalized to pi. So all we need is just to put in numbers. And uno. And then the next guy, just to, just to define what the amplitude, the, the like you know, to say that's pass band and stop band, you do one one. So at zero frequency, it should be one. At frequency of 0.3, it should be one. At frequency of 0.35, it should be zero. So that's the start of the stop band. And at frequency one, which is the highest. It should be zero. Last but not least, I forgot what the one and ten is. Let me let me let me see. I, sh I should check it out in a second. So give me give me a sec. But first, let me run it, and I, I, it might not work. Oh yeah, semi log y is a great function. So if you want logarithmic y axis, use semi log y instead of plot, or use ten log ten if you want to get log as well. So se yeah, don't. It's not semi log e, right? It's semi log y. Yeah, I know. Every time I look at it, semi log e, you know, and then semi log x, you know, for for log log x. I know. I have a weird sense of humor. Then abs. And then take the FFT of B, and we use 1,024 point FFT. We know what those are. And that's what we get. So what we have, Parks McLean, and really what we're interested in is just the halfway point. So the, it will be symmetric from uh, minus pi to pi. That's what we're seeing here, 0 to pi, and then to 2 pi. So we re and it's symmetric. So we just really want this guy here. And what you've got is you've got the stop band, the pass band ripple here, and you've got your stop band ripple there, and it's in log domain. So it may look crazy, but if you do this in regular, actually let's do that. Let's do it in regular. So let's just do plot. Now you can see it a little bit. Hey. Oh, let me move it. See, so you can see. Oh, yeah, and I think the 10 and 1 is the ratio of how big, how much the stop band ripple is attenuated relative to the pass band ripple. Okay, so that, that's, that's what's going on. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah. So what happens is. We're trying to, uh, so what did I choose? So I want to weigh the stop band ripple to be attenuated more by a factor of 10 times relative to the uh, pass band ripple. So that's what we're seeing. Okay. So you can do whatever you want with this, but um, that's how you use Parks McLean. So this is the frequency response. So after all those iterations, it produces a set of coefficients. So if you want to see what those coefficients look like, just type B. And, oh yeah, that's true. So if you have an order of 102, you get 103 coefficients. So, so what ends up happening is you're going to have 103 coefficients. And all of these guys will, if you take the, it, the frequency response of that filter, will look like what we just saw. right? So in case you don't want to use FDA tool, you can try FIRLS. 
You can try FIRPM, or there are a variety of other FIR um, routines. You don't need to use FDA tool if you don't like GUIs and graphical displays. Okay? Everyone's preference. All right. Just in case you want to know a little bit more about the algorithm, what ends up happening is at the core of the Parks McLean, I mentioned this before, there's something called the Chebyshev approximation criteria and the Remez exchange algorithm that are in action in order to perform this calculation of those final coefficients. So the Remez exchange algorithm is this entire process over here. And it was, and you might say, well, where did it get such a cool name Remez from? Well, Remez was from a, is a Russian name, and the guy's name is Igvieny. Yako, Yakolevich uh, Remes, and so he devised this in 1934, I know. I can't pronounce Russian names all that well. But Wiglinski is totally pronounceable. And um, the way, uh, you know, the process is, like, you know, you have your, your filter parameters, um, and, and then you, you have, like, you know, your, uh, your initial set of L plus 2 extremal frequencies. You then calculate the optimal um, epsilon for that extremal set, you interpolate through the L plus 1 points to obtain now this guy here, this, this P e to the j omega, which happens to be what? Your A e to the j omega. That, that's how it's represented here. You calculate the new error function, and you find the local maximum errors. Then what you do is you say, are there more than L plus 2 extremals? If yes, what you do is you hold on to L plus 2 of the largest extremals. And then what you do is you go down here and you say, check whether the extremal points have changed. So what you're doing is you, you perform this operation. You find out the errors. You find out, are there L plus 2 extremals? Or are there actually more than L plus 2 extremal frequencies? What you do is if there are more, you select L plus 2 extremal frequencies corresponding to the largest errors. You then bring it down and you say, OK, do these match the existing extremal frequencies? If not, then you have that loop back and you do everything all over again. If there is no change, that's your best approximation, game over. right? So that's how Remez exchange algorithm does. So what it does is it, it iteratively goes through the process of finding those extremal frequencies until there is no change between one iteration and the next. And when there's no change, you say, OK, freeze. This is golden. Let's move on. Algorithm done. It's cool. OK, so there's quite a bit of reading. Uh, if you want to know more about things like FIR differentiators, Hilbert transforms, and the comparison of linear phase FIR filter design methods. So that's section 10.2.5. Uh, point 0.6 and point 0.7. Um, one thing I want to bring up is, like, you know, what are these guys? Just, just like, you know, these sound cool. So uh, the ideal FIR differentiator is this guy. So you might say, OK, um, remember that um, the, if in the frequency domain, uh, so in time domain, if you have some sort of differentiation, what is it in the frequency domain? It's this guy, right? it will have a frequency response that is equal to j omega. But if you take the inverse Fourier transform of that, it's going to be equal to cosine pi n over n. So that performs the differentiation operation on a function. It's taken the derivative, right? Hilbert transform, we saw this as well. What it does is it's an all-pass filter. So it lets the magnitude response through but it does play around with the phase, right? So notice the frequency response. You have minus j and you have j. Magnitude, it's the same, but you have this like 180 change between the negative frequency and the positive frequency. Okay? And then you get this wonky looking response over here in the time domain if you take the inverse Fourier transform. Okay. So with that, uh, that concludes. Uh, lecture 23 of ECE 503. Huh. Okay. All right.